Ian Scott from United Kingdom, who is going to tell us about his uh, Maltex energy system. And it's like, I caught my eye, I mean, it caught my eye that he says the too cheap to meter, which is the slogan, I think, at the early stage of the nuclear energy, has become too expensive. So he has got involved into uh, designing this system to solve that problem. So Ian, please. Here. Good afternoon. Uh, I realize I'm standing between you and the social session, so I'll try not to uh, overrun my time on this. Um, as Ted alluded to there, I returned to Newfield after something of a long gap because I couldn't believe what was happening in nuclear energy in the 21st century. Okay, thank you. So, I returned to nuclear because I couldn't believe what was happening with nuclear energy in the 21st century. By this time, we should have been generating 70-80% of the world's energy, electrical energy, from nuclear. Instead, we plateaued out at around 10-15% at best. And all the projections are, that's going to go down and not up through the rest of this century. Now, that's... That's awful. The consequences we've talked about this week, but it is just awful. So the question is why? And we, we can blame Fukushima, we can blame Three Mile Island. Ultimately, what's happened between the glory days when nuclear energy was growing in the 70s and early 80s, when it was going very fast, and later, is between about 1983 and 1990, the cost of nuclear reactors more or less trebled. So they went from actually being cheaper in real terms to build than a coal-fired power station to being about two and a half times more expensive. And that kills nuclear energy economically. You'll still get governments wanting nuclear energy. You won't get the private sector piling in and actually building these in, in bulk because it doesn't make economic sense. So what we have to do is get the cost down. And I'm quite unashamed about this. I'm about cheap nuclear energy. Now, how do you get nuclear energy to be cheap? And to answer that, you've got to look at why it's expensive. The reason it's expensive is actually Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima. We had a technology in the early part of nuclear age which actually was not safe enough. It was really very safe, but the requirement is really very high. You have a very high bar on nuclear safety. And to convert our existing reactor technology, pressurized water, boiling water reactors, into something safe enough for the public, we had to pile engineered safety systems on top of them to the point where they became economically non-viable. So to fix that, you've got to go right back to the original problem, the safety. And this is where I'm going to start talking about molten salts, because this is why I think molten salts are a good idea. They've got lots and lots of advantages. You heard many of them this week. To my mind, there's only one that really, really counts, and it's on this slide. In solid reactor fuels, metal, oxide, doesn't matter, cesium and iodine accumulate in the form of gases. They're in the form of their, el their elemental form, they're volatile. If you get a bad accident, you get a very large cloud of radioactive cesium and iodine spreading away halfway across Europe. In Chernobyl, 60% of the cesium and iodine left the reactor site and spread over half the world. Strontium, Actually, a really nasty isotope stayed where it was. A little bit left the reactor site. Nothing traveled more than about 10 miles. And the difference is volatility. And it's as simple as this. Molten salts, iodine is sodium iodide. Cesium is cesium chloride or cesium fluoride, depending on your reactor. They're non-volatile. So you actually eliminate the hazard. OK. So if it's so simple, why isn't the world powered by molten salt reactors? And I don't personally buy the, uh, it was a horrible political decision, the evil American military killed it because it couldn't make plutonium. It doesn't work like that. If it was genuinely cheaper, industry would have taken it over. A very, very important decision, which very few people know about, was made in 1949, right at the inception of the aircraft reactor experiment, which was the, pretty much the first uh, molten salt nuclear reactor to be built. And the decision was this. In 1949, their plan 
was to do a molten salt reactor by putting the molten salt into tubes, just like the fuel tubes in every reactor around the world today. Circulate a coolant past them, job done. Get all the advantages of the molten salt. It looks just like a conventional fuel. In 1950, they changed their minds and decided to build something with large number of boxes, all which have to have complicated engineering inside them. It worked. They were very clever people. But why did they make this apparently absurd decision? Now, they were not stupid. They really weren't. They were very clever people. Molten salts are very poor conductors of heat, really, really poor. Um, and if you rely on conduction alone to get the heat out of those tubes, it basically doesn't get out. Unless your tube is two millimeters in diameter or less, the fuel salt will actually boil in the tube. It wasn't going to work. But as every high school student knows, conduction is not the mechanism by which heat moves in liquids. It's almost entirely dominated by convection. And yet, these clever scientists ignored the contribution of convection in their calculations. They did that for a very, very good reason. They were building a reactor to put on an aeroplane. Aeroplanes go into dives. When they go into dives, if they're steep enough, the force of gravity apparently disappears. Gravity drives convection. So you can't put a reactor in an aeroplane which will simply stop working or worse, they'll keep working but not transfer its heat when the plane goes into a dive. They were right to ignore convection. What I actually don't understand so clearly is why all the sides have just gone off. Um, what I really don't understand, and I'm going to ask the people at Oak Ridge on Thursday and Friday this week when I'm there, giving a slightly modified version of this talk, is why they never re-examined that decision when they decided to give up on the reactor program in the air and go for a ground-based reactor. Convection suddenly becomes an extremely reliable phenomenon. Anyway, so they didn't, and what we did was we did. We went out to look at what impact convection actually had on that very simple concept of putting fuel salt into tubes. OK, now I need to talk a bit about fuel salt. I don't want to get too deep into technical detail. It's all on posters outside. You can look at it after my talk if you haven't seen it already. We made one key decision, which is not to use lithium-7, which is what they would call a brave decision because everybody else does. Lithium-7 is a massive problem because even if you purify it really well, it produces tritium on irradiation with neutrons. Tritium is a nightmare in molten salt reactors. Dissolved in molten salt, it penetrates quite happily through metals. So it will pass through your every barrier you've got, end up in your steam turbines, and you will have a regulatory nightmare. So no lithium. To get around the problem that lithium is good for giving low melting points, we use chloride salts for the fuel, a mixture of sodium chloride and actinide chlorides, and a zirconium sodium potassium fluoride as coolant salt. I won't go through all the reasons for that. There are good reasons for all those decisions. What I do want to show you is what impact that has on convective flow in these fuel tubes, applying the modern tools of computational fluid dynamics. What this shows is for a one and a half meter long, 10 millimeter diameter tube, what happens to the, uh, the liquid as you generate fission heat according to a fairly typical cosine shaped uh, peaking factor spectrum. It flows, it flows reasonably fast. That's uh, peaking at around 10 centimeters a second. Not dramatically fast, but that's actually fast enough to get quite a, heat, a large heat transfer. It's also a very complex convection pattern, as you can see from the illustration there. But the result is actually simple. The result is that you can actually get a power density in the molten salt up to about 250 kilowatts per liter and not get close to the boiling point of the salt. Now, 250 kilowatts per liter is a good number. Um, it shows on there the power density of a pressurized water reactor. So you're talking about something about double the power density of a pressurized water reactor. That means your core is half the size. That is quite good. Okay, there's a lot of detail on, on the CFD work on a poster, which is still up there, I think, if you see it after this session. Okay, doing this, the, the basic principle works. It does bring some challenges. First of all, you've got that very high temperature salt. That could peak up to, it could peak up to 1200, 1400 degrees centigrade. Uh, what's going to contain it? Well, one of the surprising 
but very gratifying things to come out of the computational fluid dynamics work was that in fact, despite the fact the fuel salt is getting very hot, the tube doesn't. In thermal transfer terms, all the resistance to heat flow is actually from the fuel salt to the tube wall. Once the heat's in there, it passes through the tube wall very quickly and is taken away by the coolant, which is actually circulating quite fast, quickly as well. The result is the fuel tube doesn't heat up significantly. It's a direct analogy to conventional fuel rods. The center of the uranium oxide pellets gets very, very hot. The zircaloy cladding doesn't. It is that direct analogy. OK, so we don't have a problem with high temperature. Quite a few people have talked about corrosion. Corrosion is a bit of a nightmare with molten salts. And there's a very good question asked in this last but one presentation about what you're going to do with chloride salts, which are very corrosive against hastaloids. And let me answer that one. We've looked at this quite carefully. And let me explain a little bit about how we've looked at it. Corrosion by molten salts is a very different process to corrosion by steam or by water. If you look at the, uh, the chemical equilibria between water and steel, the equilibrium position is actually a pile of rust. If you look at the equilibrium between water and zirconium alloy, the equilibrium position is a load of zirconium oxide and hydrogen. That's where it goes to. The, chemist, the chemical thermodynamics drives it that way. Steel doesn't corrode that way. Stainless steel doesn't corrode that way in water because it is kinetically stable. The corrosion is still happening, but it's happening very, very slowly. If you leave it long enough, it will end up as a pile of rust, but it's very slow. That doesn't work in molten salts. Molten salts strip off the protective layers and if the metal is going to react with the molten salt and dissolve in it, it will do it. So what we did was to simulate in computer a partially burned fuel salt, the details there, all the fission products, and the excess halogen that's released during fission of actinide chlorides. And we looked at the equilibrium concentration of chromium, which is the most vulnerable element in steel, under those conditions. Now, the red line at the top is what you get if you use Hastelloy N and just put that fuel salt in as it is. And the, the question that came from the audience about what about chlorides, the answer is it eats its way through the Hastelloy, even Hastelloy. It might take a while. This doesn't say how fast it'll happen, but leave it long enough, it's eaten its way through. The green line doesn't show Hastelloy. It shows ordinary 316 stainless steel. And it shows it with a small amount of metallic zirconium put on the inside of the tube. This could be a coating on the inside of the tube. It could be an insert in the tube. It doesn't actually matter as long as it's in contact with the salt. It's changing the salt chemistry, not affecting the metal. Under those conditions, the amount at 600 degrees that you get of chromium dissolved is about one part per billion. That is not corroding anything. Anything under one part per million, and you're absolutely safe. So with this addition, Chloride salts in ordinary steels become entirely practical. And there's detail on that on another poster outside. OK. Um, the third problem with molten salts, can be a problem, can be a solution, is that they don't trap volatile uh, fission products, in particular the noble gases. In uranium oxide pellets, these are trapped more or less in the pores in the pellet. In molten salts, they will just bubble out. And if you allow them to build up, you will build up to quite high pressure in your uh, fuel tube. It's, exa it's actually what happens in metallic fueled reactors. They bleed out the zirconium as well, and they have to have big spaces in the fuel tube to minimize the pressure, but they're still a bit dangerous. A suggestion was not my idea. It was actually put in by an engineering company I was talking with, uh, was why not simply let them vent? And I said, that's mad. These are radioactive gases. You can't just vent, vent them. I said, oh, yeah, probably right. But then I went home. I thought, hmm, I wonder. I'm making an assumption there. I went and checked the assumption. This shows the gases that evolve from this very hot molten fuel salt. The red is what evolves from the salt at about 1,000 degrees at its full temperature. But the salt also then condenses on the cooler walls of the tube in the gap above the fuel salt. That's at the temperature of the coolant salt itself. So it condenses to about 600 degrees. And that is the green bar. 
And what you see is that the nasty radioisotopes are non-volatile. Cesium, iodine, they stay in place, as does nearly everything else. The only things that come out, it's probably hard for you to see that, are xenon, krypton, inevitably, and radiologically quite benign. Some zirconium tetrachloride, which is not a problem because that vents into the coolant salt, which is already zirconium-based. And a bit of cadmium, which would simply be taken out by the filtration system. And almost nothing else. So venting the fuel tubes is actually practical, and it's a huge advantage because that means they don't get pressurized. That reduces the risk of failure dramatically. You have an unpressurized tube with no metal, sorry, no ceramic pellets inside, which is going to swell and change shape and crack and interact with the cladding, all the things which many people in this audience know a lot about. All those problems go away. OK, and there's a poster on that. So we have the position we can build a fuel assembly which looks really like the fuel assemblies for conventional reactors, particularly conventional sodium-cooled fast reactors. The, we can use the same materials. In the context of the, of the uh, fuel tubes, we would use mnemonic P16, which is a very low expansion under neutron flux. It was designed uh, for the Dunria fast reactor in the UK, in fact. And it has a very low neutron expansion. Even the vented tubes here are not new. The only thing new here is actually putting salt in. The result of that is that this reactor can actually take advantage of about 60 years of hard work in optimizing how to build fuel assemblies. You have a huge technological heritage to draw on. OK. I don't actually want to talk about the reactor. There's some detail on the poster outside. This is a fast spectrum actinide burning reactor. You can build just about any type of reactor you want. There's no problem in making this moderated thermal spectrum, epithermal spectrum. I'll talk a little bit at the end about how you can make it into a thorium breeder, because I think I should be here. But it looks quite like a sodium fast reactor. It acts quite like a sodium fast reactor, but it doesn't use sodium. And that's a big advantage. You know, I don't like the idea of thousands of cubic, of, of thousands of uh, liters of uh, molten sodium around. But actually, the coolant we're using, the zirconium fluoride coolant, is better than sodium. In three ways. First of all, it doesn't catch fire or react with water. Secondly, it actually has a volumetric heat capacity nearly three times higher than sodium, which means that the velocity of flow required is three times less. And finally, uh, and, and a, a real surprise to us when we did the neutronics, the void coefficient of that coolant salt is hugely negative. Sodium has a positive void coefficient which causes a lot of problems in the design of sodium fast reactors. Pancake cores, high leakage, all that sort of thing. This has a massive negative void coefficient. That gives it a, a huge level of intrinsic safety. And of course, the temperature coefficient of reactivity is very, very favorable as well, as it is with all molten salt reactors. OK, so to wrap up, simpler. It is actually really simple. Uh, Sodium cooled fast reactors are actually quite simple if they weren't made so horribly complicated by using sodium. Uh, we're using so much existing technology in the fuel assemblies. Compared to other molten salt reactors, we don't have to pump. We're not doing anything clever to remove fission products. We don't have anything clever with gas. We don't have these emergency drain systems with freeze valves, which are actually an engineered solution to a safety hazard. If you don't drain the fuel, it will actually heat to the point it will burst out of the tank. You have to have the drain system. It is an engineered safety solution. You don't need it. Not there. Uh, you don't have to put filters in to remove uh, noble metals. They're just precipitated in the fuel tubes. Safety, it's got all the benefits of molten salt fuel, and that's actually the big safety thing. Molten salts are a brilliant idea for safety. It's passively cooled because of the pool design, just like a sodium fast reactor. If you did get a leakage, let's say a terrorist dropped a small bomb inside the core and smashed all those fuel tubes, the fuel salt is miscible with the coolant salt. It spreads out, by definition is non-critical there because of the dilution. The fission products are still non-volatile, so you have a big tank of radioactive liquid, not actually going anywhere. You'd want to stop it keeping heating up until it boils, but that could take quite a while. And I haven't talked about this in detail, but it's very compatible with being continuously refueled so you can avoid excess reactivity. 
Okay, the third adjective in the title of this talk is cheaper. And it's the one I start with, it's the one I'm going to end with. Cheaper really matters. And uh, the chairman of our session was absolutely right in saying, when a reactor vendor stands up and says, I can build it for $2,000 a kilowatt, don't believe them. I, I actually completely agree with that statement. Costing early stage designs is actually a really a quite challenging thing to do and requires a degree of humility. So we decided we couldn't do it. Instead, we went to a very reputable engineering company, Atkins Limited, one of the big nuclear consultancies in the UK, prime contractor for Arriva. They've been involved in building reactors. They, they know this stuff in depth. And we said, what do you need to do to give us a sensible initial cost estimate for this? And they said, okay, we'll go away and we'll come back and tell you. And you won't argue with us or we won't do it. We do it our way or not at all. And their way was actually to do an incredibly detailed safety analysis, a thing called HAZOP analysis, looking at all the bits and pieces which we haven't thought about that you would need, the regulars would need in that reactor to make it safe to commission, to build, commission, operate, and decommission, whole life cycle. And only when they'd done that and identified all of those structure systems and components did they then go and do the easy bit, which is the costing. And so we waited with bated breath just how expensive it had, been, had they managed to make our beautiful reactor. The answer was not very expensive at all. This graph shows the capital cost, overnight capital cost, for those who know what that means, for nuclear reactors from the first ones that were built in the States through to the present day, the Hinkley C reactor in the UK. You can see up to about 1983, they were actually quite uh, cheap. The black bar on that graph is the cost of building a coal-fired power station. And all of this is in constant 2014 money. It's not inflation stuff here. This is all real apples to apples comparison. So up until about 1983, it was cheaper to build a nuclear reactor than a coal-fired power station. That's what we need to get back to. Post-1983, it went out of sight. The nuclear island for this reactor, the whole nuclear island, this includes the civil engineering, everything. This isn't some sort of just, this is the metal in the reactor. This is a complete nuclear island, about $1,000 per kilowatt. Steam island, about the same again. There are some costs not included in that. I put other costs there. We haven't included the cost of feed co cooling water, because that's site dependent. We haven't included the cost of a security perimeter and buying the land, because that's site dependent as well. But those are not enormous costs compared to the bigger ones of the nuclear island and the steam island. And we can afford another entire nuclear island as a cost overrun before we get to the same level, level as coal. This reactor genuinely can save the world because it would be cheap enough to displace coal. And the reason it's so cheap is because it is so safe. Now, I must talk about thorium. That would be rude of me not to, having been kindly invited here. The very, very first design company I did for this was a, was a thorium breeder. And when I talked to expert people, they said, you must be mad. How hard do you want to make this problem? You're already trying to do a new reactor. Why bring in thorium and all the extra complexities? I said, you're absolutely right. And so we moved away from that. We made it into a, a much simpler reactor, a, a, a burner. And I've never given up on thorium. And in fact, turning this reactor, if I just go back to the design, turning that reactor into a thorium breeder is actually superficially very simple. And the, I'm sure there's devil in the detail. Instead of using a zirconium fluoride-based coolant, you use a thorium fluoride-based coolant. You then breed uranium in the coolant salt. You avoid the problem of protactinium poisoning of neutrons, which is a, quite a big problem when you actually put the thorium into the fuel. A lot of the protactinium gets destroyed and uses up neutrons along the way. Because the, most of the coolant salt at any one time is outside the core, you actually lose relatively few neutrons to protactinium. So you have a breeder. There's a fair bit of engineering detail needs to be added to that, but in broad principle, it's there and it can be done. And so at that point, I will say thank you all very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Ian, for a entertaining and exciting presentation. Uh, the, yeah.
thank you for a very, very interesting talk. Uh, my question is, uh, you mentioned that this core has very negative void question, void re reactivity. Uh, is that the case if you use uranium plutonium fuel uh, or uh, in case of only thorium? What we modeled was a reactor grade plutonium fuel. So 60% 239, 40% 240. Oh. Um, and the, the reactivity coefficient, temperature coefficient, was minus 12 PCM per degree Kelvin. Really? Yeah. So you use plutonium fuel and you get negative void question yeah. with fast spectrum. Yeah. We were all quite it's surprised a, at that number. It's amazing. And uh, well, what is the uh, burn up and uh, how to, what is the final disposal form? Okay. Burn up, one of, one of the real beauties of, of doing this, this scheme is that the usual things that limit burn up no longer apply. So you don't have fuel pellets, you know, breaking into bits, as, you know, you don't, ha you don't have pellet cladding interactions. Actually, the, the, the limit is going to be neutronic at the end of the day. So you could talk about, sorry, I don't talk um, megawatt d hours per metric ton unit. I can't get my head around that unit. I use percentage fissile consumption. You could do 20%, 20 more percent fissile consumption perfectly reasonably. Whether it would be economically sensible to go that high, I rather doubt. But practically, technically, there's nothing to stop you going to very, very high uh, fissile consumption levels. Keeping breeding performance. Well, this isn't a breeder. This is a burner. Yeah, 20% burner. Okay. I'm not going to speculate on what the breeding ratios would be because I've been told repeatedly by people who know better than me not to try to use intuition to predict neutronics. Do the sums, do the calculations. So I don't know, and I'm not going to pretend I do, but hell, it's going to be a breeder with thorium in. Thank you. And the final for disposal form, chemical form. The, this requires, the fuel cycle is, is, is actually one of the big challenges because you do have to have a new fuel cycle. You need, you need your, your actinides in the trichloride form. You know, this cries out for a, pri a pyro processing molten salt based reprocessing. The, because the fuel will tolerate really quite high levels of contamination, and the reason it can do that is that the major contaminants when you try to separate uh, actinides are the lanthanides. And the lanthanides have the same melting point as trichlorides as do, the, uh, as do the actinides. So you can tolerate quite a lot of lanthanide contamination. That allows you to do a pyroprocessing type uh, reprocessing very easily because you're not, you're not trying to get high purity. Now, if you're going to make solid MOX type fuel, you need really pure plutonium. Otherwise, the ceramic doesn't work. This, the plutonium can contain as much as 50% of things other than plutonium, and it'll be absolutely fine as a fuel. So we would anticipate reprocessing the salt from this, pulling out the non-actinide fission products, relatively short-lived, 300 years or so, and then the actinides go right back into the reactor. So a closed fuel cycle, but one which is just technically enormously less challenging than is the, re the, the closed fuel cycle for solid fuels. Last question here. So. I'm very interested in these uh, negative void coefficient. Uh, the negative void coefficient of a sodium-cooled uh, UPU system is not so much a property of the sodium, it's a property of a uh, of the efficient cross-section of, of plutonium but because what happens if if you go beyond the uh, boiling temperature of sodium you create bubbles so you, your density of sodium becomes smaller you have less uh, moderation and therefore the neutron spectrum becomes harder and since the efficient cross-section increases with the neutron yeah. energy then you get your uh, positive void coefficient so is this negative void coefficient come in simply from the fact that the, the, the salt cannot boil? Or wh wh what is making it negative? Uh, that's a, that is a really good question. And I'm, what I'm going to give you as an answer is a, an informed speculation. So let me be very clear. I we thought have, you made the simulation. Uh, we, have, we have not done the simulation to prove this. But the, what we see is the most likely reason for it is the fact that uh, the fluorine, as you know, is a lousy moderator. 
uh, it's too heavy. But fluorine has a strong resonance for inelastic scatter at about 500 keV neutron energy. The result is that the, uh, the, the neutral spectrum with the fluoride present has a big dip, I mean a really big dip, uh, around 500 keV and a bulge at around uh, 100 keV down to 50 keV. Um, so you're actually getting a quite dramatic but limited moderation at the high energy. Our speculation, and, that, and, and I'd, I'd, I'd be really interested in your view on this, is that, that the loss of that high energy moderation when we get a void is the reason for the drop in reactivity. We can't see any, any, anything else that would do it, to be honest. But I would be, I'm very, very open to, to ideas like that because we have not actually tied it down in detail. What do you think? Well, uh, it has to be uh, simulated, I Indeed. think. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. I, w I can never get an opinion from a nuclear scientist. They always say, I've got to go away and spend a year to do some work. <laughs> yeah, well, we are scientists. That's the point. <laughs> no, no. Have you never heard of hypotheses? Is that a reasonable hypothesis? That I don't know. I, until I make the simulation, I would not know. I, I don't want to judge. I just okay. want to I presented to the see. hypothesis. <laughs> we, we will test it, I promise. <laughs> If you can beat us to testing it, I'd be delighted. Thank you very much, Ian. Thank you. Oh. Thank you very much. Thank you.